and we came up with the uh, the motto of no bullshit just by talking amongst ourselves uh, and trying to come up with a set of words that described how we feel about our customer interactions and and, and our interactions with each other. And uh, and one of our administrators was saying, it's so hard to come up with something when really what we want to say is that we're a no bullshit company. And that was it. After that, that was the phrase. Uh, and we, we copyright wrote the, <laughs> the phrase and we put it on our website. And, uh, and you know, it really wouldn't work um, unless we also had the, the promise of not advertising. So we don't advertise at all. Uh, the only thing we do is sponsor deserving projects that, uh, that have the same kind of philosophy that we do. And, uh, and so this allows us to avoid the sort of restrictions on using the word bullshit in <laughs> our, uh, our media and, and, in when we, and when we talk. Um, hopefully you won't have to edit that out of this, this video when you post it on the internet or wherever you're going to do with it. Uh, but, but it's actually also, it's, it's honest in, in a way. I, um, when I first joined the company, I was saying, hmm, that's a little odd. How can that be professional, right? But I've decided that, you know, everyone uses a little bit of profanity in their lives unless they're a fundamentalist, and that's fine. But just about everybody else uses a little bit of profanity in their lives. And it's not profane in that sense. We're not, we're not using it in a profane sense. We're using it in an honest sense, saying we won't bullshit the customer. We won't give them uh, marketing emails. We won't send them offers for stuff they don't need. Uh, and we won't advertise. We won't. Uh, we won't buy banner ads or Super Bowl ads or any of the stuff that some of our competitors have been known to do. Uh, and I think this re really resonates with customers. The internet is changing, and the the pressures are uh, on the internet are very strong. And as that is happening, as we as the internet evolves and becomes more of a force for business and in our daily lives, some of the bigger uh, power structures are really trying to, <laughs> to control it. Um, and we see this internationally, we see this nationally, but how it affects Gandhi is you know, both direct and indirect, right? Um, we have a stake in who controls the internet. We have a stake in network neutrality. We have a stake in the uh, in the the privacy laws that get implemented in the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, in the um, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, all of these things affect whether the internet remains free and open, and that affects our business, and that affects more importantly our customers. So we've made a promise to ourselves to advocate for a free and open internet, and to do this as part of our way of doing business. Um, and I'm, I'm actually very proud of this about Gandhi. We were very active uh, in, in the debates around, we were very active in the debates around SOPA and PIPA, around um, some of the other security and, and privacy uh, reforms that, that were proposed. We're active in lobbying for ECPA reform, ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and for CFAA reform. Uh, and we're also uh, advocating against the current FCC proposal for network neutrality, loosening the uh, the definition of network neutrality to allow a fast lane. We think that hurts everybody. We think that hurts innovation, and, and it hurts us directly, but it also hurts our customers. Gandhi actually has implemented our, our payment system in a particular way, and we don't process, store, or transmit customer credit card data. So it doesn't exist in our databases. It's, it's not possible to get it out of our databases. Uh, and we think this is to our advantage and, more importantly, to our customer's advantage. Because if Gandhi is hacked, that customer credit card is not available to the hacker. Um, that's somewhat inconvenient to us and somewhat inconvenient to the customer, um, then we're striking a balance, really, uh, to try to make it as convenient as possible to the customer and still preserve that level of security, that, that, uh, 
that level of safety, if you will, in the credit card transaction processing. The, the, as you pointed out with the Target case last year, it, it really is a free-for-all. There are organized uh, entities out there trying to steal credit cards and succeeding. <laughs> and we, um, we have to do what we can, really, to be responsible with our customers' trust in, in this area. Sometimes uh, it means that the credit card is maybe denied when they try to use it. Um, uh, we're working on ways to address that, though, and I think we're you know, coming up. We're going to have uh, um, a bit of a smoother experience, um, and uh, you know, constant improvement is our motto here. So, <laughs> but we won't compromise our principles in order to make those improvements. Gandhi originally was only in France, um, and but it, it's kind of a feature of the internet and the internet business. As soon as you fire up that server, you're instantly global, right? So we've had international customers from day one, uh, and that's okay. We can deal with that. We can find ways to allow them to pay for and use their services from France, um, but ultimately uh, we're serving our customers better by locating subsidiaries here in the U.S. Uh, and in Asia and even in Luxembourg where we have really excellent peering arrangements uh, with, with the rest of Europe. So we're always looking for ways to uh, you know, smooth out the customer experience and this is one of them. This is you know, just allowing the, um, the fact that we're an international company to work to our advantage. Um, the registrar is actually in France. So I know this is a, a matter of some concern to, uh, to U.S. customers that uh, the data that they store and the domains that they store with Gandhi are actually not under U.S. control. And just to address that a little bit, I think, you know, having the registrar in France means that the privacy laws of the EU apply. Uh, and the legal framework for extracting that data for U.S. authorities really doesn't exist uh, or is still in the, the realm of case law. So it's again something we're advocating uh, for our customers' privacy and our, our right, the customer's right to have that data remain private. Um, and it's actually playing out right in front of us. Like I said before, it's evolving right in front of us. Um, so I think it's, it's important for, that our customers know that we're going to fight for their rights to privacy, and we're going to make sure that uh, if it's if there's a, a battle to be fought on that front, that we're going to fight it. It's a very very complicated legal situation, and uh, and I could point to cases where the U.S. authorities have pressured even the registries to shut down domain names, um, and. You know, as I said, this is playing out in front of us. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the the battle over privacy and the battle over surveillance and what kind of surveillance the governments are allowed to do legally. I think everybody knows they all do it, mm -hmm. <laughs> but but what they're allowed to do legally and what they're allowed to do constitutionally that is something else again, and that differs between the U.S. and the EU. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, they cooperate way more than we would like them to. Uh, I think, as as individual citizens of the U.S. Uh, and and the EU, I think there's a lot of information sharing going on that we don't know about. Andy has done very well by open source, um, and I mean that in two ways. I think that we've certainly made great use of open source within Gandhi and we've uh, pre pretty much every major system inside of Gandhi is either based on open source or is at least 80 90 percent open source code um, we have done pretty well for the open source community I think we've submitted several patches to you know the core things that we use uh, and and we've had some experience uh, pushing um, the limits of those open source packages in our environment, especially in the hosting side. Uh, so we've run up against the limits and we've kind of pushed them out a little bit and found some bugs in ZFS and things like that. Um, 
I think that in order to do this uh, it going forward, this is an, an evolving area as well. To, in order to do this well going forward, we have to evolve too, and we have to make open source and publishing our innovations in open source a priority inside the company in order to do it well. I think there are benefits for doing that. Um, I don't think that developers like having bad code be open, right? So it has this effect of making the code better. Um, and, uh, but, it, but at the same time, it takes a lot of effort to publish stuff. And it takes a, a commitment to doing it and putting it on the high, high on the priority list and following it up and maintaining it that uh, it's sometimes difficult to justify in the face of other projects. But we're working on that. And in fact, uh, why am I here in LinuxCon in Chicago? I'm talking about a major package that we released in open source just a few months ago as the, the VNT package. I think the, the real killer app out there is still email. Um, cloud, yes, that's important. And let me just affirm here, you know, Gandhi abides by the law. If we are legally required to dis divulge the data, we don't have a choice, and we are going to divulge it. Uh, so we concentrate our efforts in lobbying to get the laws to be fair um, and to have transparency in that area. The pushback against the advent of surveillance and the disclosures of Edward Snowden and, um, and others uh, about the extent of surveillance and the sort of the, the unconstitutional extent of surveillance uh, has been in the encryption community. And, you know, I think Julian Assange said it very well, you know, the, the cypherpunks are going to take over. Um, we, uh, we will be part of that revolution if we have to be. Some of our uh, core people are involved in a project for precisely this, secure communications with uh, community ratings of the security of those communications. Um, as the projects that you mentioned mature and become you know, stable and, and, they, uh, and the limits of them are discovered, uh, we may very well decide to offer them. Uh, but you know, that's not to say that there won't be a legal framework. If we're not vigilant, you know, and if our customers aren't vigilant, uh, particularly, their data may get exposed. I, I think, you know, there's kind of a dichotomy in security and privacy these days. Uh, in on the one hand, uh, you know, we are very concerned about our communications and about the government's right to snoop on them. And on the other hand, we go and sign up for a giveaway or Facebook and post, you know, all these details about where we are, what we're doing, you know, who we like, who we don't like, you know, what our favorite color is. All this is personal data, and it becomes part of a dossier somewhere. <laughs> if we you know, if we become a person of interest, that's part of our dossier. So we need to be aware uh, and have privacy become part of our culture again if we really want to address this problem. Otherwise, it will become sort of uh, ridiculous to start insisting on our data being private when we disclose it all the time. Topically, right now, there is a big debate in this country about something that's mind-numbingly boring at the legal level, and that is network neutrality. Mm -hmm. And believe me, this is dry, dry material. <laughs> but it turns out that the Federal Communications Commission right now has on the table a proposal that would make the network neutrality uh, that we've all enjoyed the benefits of and the, the kind of innovation that is possible for like Facebook and Google, it's really in no small part due to the fact that there's been a level playing field. As this law wends its way uh, toward completion, if it is not changed, we may see the end of the internet as we know it. And I know it's boring, I know it's dry material to say whether Section 706 or Title II should be used to regulate broadband providers. But this is important, people. We need to take some time and 
figure it out, understand it, take a position, let the FCC know how you feel. Um, try, please, and my, this is my plea to <laughs> whoever's watching this video, please send your comments to the FCC. Tell them that we do not want a fast lane, a paid fast lane on the internet for some providers at the expense of others. It will, it will really, it will kill the internet as we know it.